Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd, the show where I talk about roleplay games and today we're going to be playing 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and we finished up the puzzles behind the one door. We learned a bit more about Alice and about Cass and just a bunch of different things. We're also hoping that we prevented Clover from going crazy and axe murdering everyone. And yeah... Before we get into this, there are a few things that I need to talk about, so if you want to go ahead and just get into the action, then go ahead and skip to the time on screen, or use the time, the time codes in the description. First of all, it has been a while since I have last uploaded, and I've just been, wa I've been wanting to record, but I keep either forgetting or just ha not, have been not having enough energy, and you know, there are a lot of things that's been going on recently, and... I was just, you know, I wanted to eventually get around to uploading, but I just didn't, and I apologize for that. Second of all, uh, I've been wanting to start changing my intro because it's very long. You know, the hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd, the show where I talk about roleplay games. And today we're going to be playing Nine Hours, Nine Person, Nine Doors in the last episode, if you don't remember. And then the recap. It's insanely long, and I can't believe I've been doing it for this long. So, maybe starting with the next LP, I'll have it shortened to something like, Hello guys, and welcome to... Hello guys, and welcome back to 9 Hours, 9 Person, 9 Doors in the last episode, and then do the recap. Because you already know who you've clicked on, and if you don't, you can just look at the channel name right below the video. So, I don't really need that part of the intro. So, I'll be cutting that out from now on. But anyways, guys, now that we've gotten all of that stuff out of the way, I'm ready to actually get back into the game. He ran. And ran. And ran. At the end of the hallway was a door. Actually, I can just skip by this stuff. It's been so long that I completely forgot. Ooh, but now this stuff has changed. Remember, this is the part where Junpei noticed the axe sticking up out of the uh, back of... Uh, Clover's shirt. A note. A note? Yeah, I found it in the pocket of the guy with the captain's clothes. He said something about the darkness of the sinister hand or something. You'll remember that that is from the safe ending. That's the note that Clover got uh, that told us how to get into the safe. What the hell? Let me see it. But Junpei wasn't going to get to see it. From the other end of the hall, he heard Ace's voice. Hey, Junpei, Clover, what are you two doing? Hurry up. Clover shrugged. I'll show it to you later, alright? Come on, we gotta hurry. Before Junpei could protest, she was gone. Around the corner and off down the long stem of the L. A note. A note. Junpei was curious. But there was something else that bothered him. Her pocket had been bulging, far more than it would from just a note. And we begin skipping. They reached B deck at the same time. Jumpy! Clover! Jun's face was excited. Something had happened, that much Junpei could tell by simply looking at her. What's up? Given their situation, he was not inclined to be excited about sudden developments. Jun, however, couldn't contain herself. We found it! Found what? We found it! What did you find? The last door! We found door 9! What? Come on, just follow us! We'll explain on the way! Uh, okay, let's go! Seven turned and jogged off down the stairs. The rest followed. We finally made it! The relief and excitement in her voice echoed what each one of them felt. Yeah, it's finally time. Jinpei wasn't quite ready to believe they'd really done it, at least not yet. Still, if everyone said that it was door 9, then it probably was. He could feel his heart racing. A mixture of anticipation and fear ran through his veins, and he could feel his legs shaking. He was doing his best to maintain a sense of healthy skepticism, but he couldn't deny that the prospect of escape was an exciting one. But there was one other thing he couldn't get off his mind. The numbered door could only accommodate between 3 and 5 people. There were 7 of them on their way to the door 9. That meant that even in the best case scenario, there would be two of them who would have to stay behind. Two people. He didn't have any solutions to that problem yet, but he was desperately hoping one would present itself. 
Junpei looked over at the clock. The hands indicated that it was 4.30. They had 90 minutes before their time was up. Hey, Junpei, Jun, what the hell are you two doing? Hurry it up. Santa's voice jolted Junpei out of his reverie. Let's go, Jumpy. June took off down the stairs, jogging as quickly as she could. Junpei followed. As a group, they piled onto the elevator and rode impatiently down to Edek. It looked familiar. There was a metal grate between the two elevators. Seven grabbed hold of it and began to talk. I know I told you I'd explain it earlier, but honestly, there ain't much to explain. After we split off from you guys, the four of us got into an elevator on the left, and that took us to the other side of the grate. After that... And they'd headed down another hallway. It took them toward the bow of the ship and eventually to the number six that Junpei and Jun had found earlier. With four, they'd been able to open the door and keep going. As usual, they faced a locked door, but had been forced to complete two different areas before they could unlock it. Once they went through that door, there was another hallway that went into the other direction toward the stern. So, on your way, you found the elevator. That's right. So in other words, you kind of did a lap, huh? You came from that you came from that side to this side. Yeah. With that settled, Junpei looked around. So, where's the number nine door? Over here. Follow me. Seven began walking down the hallway that led toward the stern. Junpei and the others broke into a jog to keep up with him. They'd been walking for a while, June in silent step with Junpei when she spoke. You know, it's because of Santa that we're all here right now. Huh? That all seven of us are going to door nine. You don't get it? Santa's seven and Lotus. What's their digital root? 3 plus 7 plus 8 equals 18, 1 plus 8 equals 9. 9. It's 9. That's right! They could have just left me behind and kept going if they'd wanted to. But they didn't. Yes! Because Santa wouldn't let them. He said we can't leave June behind. That's why we went looking for you guys. And then you got on the elevator and went back to the central staircase. That's right! Hmm. Well, I wouldn't have called that one. Santa would be the one to... St that Santa would be the one to stick up for you, I mean. Junpei felt his eyebrows knit as he considered that. Oh, don't get me wrong. Perhaps June had sensed Junpei's concern. I don't mean that Seven and Lotus said they wanted to leave me behind. We were just talking about it and Santa objected to it first. Junpei was about to respond when Seven suddenly stopped. Before we get into this, I just want to say that this uh, go-through is... A lot happier than the previous ones were and not just because of this section right here the entire time up to this point we haven't really had any problems uh, we didn't get into a fight over which door to go through with the four and five doors Junpei didn't pull anything with a number three door uh, and then although Junpei did pull something with the number one door that was ultimately pretty harmless because everyone still got through in the end and Clover's been a lot happier because she now knows that Snake is alive and we found the number nine door so all around this has just been the happiest possible go through and this is kind of what the Zero Escape games are all about it's basically, you have a bunch of choices, a bunch of options, and it's all about finding which path leads you to the happiest possible outcome. Seven suddenly stopped. In front of them stood a door. So this is... Junpei couldn't see Seven's face, but he could see him nod. There's no other place for us to go? Nope. Just look around. At the end of the hallway was a thick iron wall. To the left and right, other hallways led to the port and starboard sides, sides of the ship, but they were both closed off by thick metal grates. It looked as though Seven was right. The door in front of them was their only choice. Alright, let's get moving. He pulled open the door and walked in. Junpei took a deep breath and followed. 
it appeared they'd been telling the truth. The first thing that Junpei saw as he entered the room was the number. Nine. Like all the others, it was a rough thing made of red paint. The door it decorated sat on the back wall in, of a rectangular room. Junpei ran up to it. It was a large double door with powerful styling. Something about it was almost majestic, and it made the red paint look especially garish. Junpei grabbed the handle and shook. It didn't budge, but then he hadn't really expected it to. The red was bolted to the wall next to the door. It display, its display read vacant. Finally, they'd arrived. Junpei felt a flood of emotion wash over him. He felt a chill down his back, and his chest tightened even as his blood began to boil. He was about to speak when... Junpei, look behind you! He turned around. Junpei could scarcely believe what he saw. A door. And a nine. There was... Another one. H hey! What the hell? What the hell is going on here? His words came slowly, and his brain struggled to understand what he'd seen. On shaky legs, he made his way to the second nine. It was a small door, set parallel to the door they'd come through, but in the other corner of the room. Nine. There was no mistaking the number, and if any more proof was needed, a red was bolted to the wall near the door. He grabbed the handle and shook the door, not because he expected it to open, but because he had to make sure it was real. Why the hell... are there two doors? It was Ace who spoke first. Do you think perhaps one is the right door and the other is the wrong one? Lotus was skeptical. I don't know about that. That seems unlikely. What makes you say so? Well, think about all the rooms we've been through so far. They're full of puzzles, but there are always hints about how to solve them. I'm pretty sure, that, I'm pretty sure there aren't any rooms where we just had to go with our best guess and leave it to instinct to solve the puzzle. Do you really think that... At the very end of the game, Zero's going to suddenly throw in something that depends entirely on luck? Then you're saying there's some sort of hint in this room. No, I don't think there's a hint anywhere in here. I searched it very well when I was in here before. I didn't find anything that might have been a hint, though. Hmm. Well, then that means... Yeah, both are the right door. I mean, if you think about it, Zero never actually said there was only one door with a 9 on it. The exit is hidden, but it is there. Seek the exit. Seek the door that carries a nine. I thought it said seek a way out. Junpei began to mutter to himself. So if there are two number nine doors, if we split it up right, that's not gonna work. Junpei blinked and looked up at Clover. She held out her hand. You've got a notebook and a pen, right? Can I borrow them? Slightly confused, he pulled them out and handed them to her. Look at this! Clover opened the notebook to a blank page and set it down on the desk. Everyone else gathered around her and watched as she wrote down a series of numbers. You get it? The numbers on the top are all the combinations with digital roots of nine. The numbers on the bottom are the people who don't fit. There's only eight possibilities if we split up into two groups of three or four people. So... If three people go through the door, then four are left behind. If four go through, then three are left behind, right? Clover nodded, almost as if she were pleased with herself for solving a difficult math problem. The room went very quiet. Silence lay across everyone like a thick, heavy blanket. No one spoke. Their faces were blank. Desperate for something else to look at, Junpei turned his eyes to the room around him. As he did, he began to wonder. What was it? The walls were covered with candles. The wavering flame made the shadows of Junpei and his companions look as though they were dancing. Two rows of wooden pews filled most of the room. Between them was a strip of rich red carpet. The carpet ran straight through the room, ending at the door that pointed to the stern of the boat. At the other end of the carpet, an 
altar. It was a recessed space set into the wall between the two other doors. Sitting on a raised section of the altar was... A coffin. A coffin. A coffin. A coffin. No. It couldn't possibly be. But if it wasn't, then whose body occupied it? That was as far as Junpei wanted to pursue that line of thought. He decided not to think about the coffin for the time being. At that moment, Seven spoke. There was an edge of humor to his voice, but it was forced. Okay, I give up, I give up. I figured if we sat around here long enough, somebody would volunteer, but I guess nobody's got the guts to do it. Junpei didn't understand, and he wasn't the only one. What? You guys didn't figure it out yet? Ugh, fine, fine. Let me enlighten you. Clover was mostly right with her little explanation earlier, but she missed something. She wasn't really wrong, she just, uh... Ah, screw it. Let me write it out. Seven snatched up the notebook and began to write in it. Everyone else clustered around him, desperate for a look. If you're trying to leave with a group of three and a group of four, and get everyone out, Clover's right. But there's another way. Only one combination, though. If you split us up into groups of three, three, and one, you can make this combination. Wait, this means... Don't get me wrong here. I'm not trying to copy Ace or some anything like that. Even if he hadn't been the hero back in the big hospital room, I'd still be saying the same thing. The same thing? Are you saying... Yeah, I am. I'll stay behind. Why are you acting all heroic all of a sudden? Are you some kind of an idiot? Lotus was the first to speak. That in itself was a little strange. She'd reacted much differently when Ace had volunteered. I'm completely against this. I'll be goddamned if I'm going to have you have to owe you for getting me out of here. The rest of them began to speak all at once. I'm against it too. I didn't want to leave Ace behind and I don't want to leave you either. I don't like that idea. That's gotta be there's gotta be other options. I disagree as well. I can't say I care much for you being the hero. Finally they quieted down. Junpei looked at Seven. Well, there you go, Seven. Proposal denied. Clover's right. There's gotta be a better way than this. Seven made some noise that was somewhere between a derisive snort and a cough. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. He was doing his best to pretend they were making a foolish de decision, but Junpei could see twinkling of water at the corners of Seven o Seven's eyes. That was when Santa spoke. Whoa, hold on a minute. I haven't said anything yet. Until then, Junpei hadn't realized that Santa had stayed quiet for the whole discussion of Seven's fate. Something in his voice made Junpei uncomfortable. Are you... agreeing? You want to leave him here? Santa shook his head. Nah, I'm against it. I don't want to leave Seven here alone. Then I don't see how it matters... I said alone. Huh? I said, I don't want to leave Seven alone. There was a dull shine in Santa's eyes. They were cold and hard. Junpei felt himself shiver. What, what the hell are you... What, you don't get it? I can't leave just one person. I need two more. Three people, including Seven. I'll be leaving th behind three people. That's my proposal. No, those are my orders. What do you mean, orders? What the hell makes you think you can order us around? Who the hell's gonna listen to you? You all will. In three seconds, you won't have a choice. What? Three, two, one. Santa was so fast, Junpei could barely see him. When he moved, it was almost like watching a dance. His feet moving like lightning. He spun and... Ah! He had June. See? I told you. His lips curled into a cruel, mocking smile. A shudder traveled the length of Junpei's spine. 
His chest froze, and he could feel his breath go stale in his lungs. Nothing made sense. Junpei felt as though his head were about to explode. Santa's sudden change in attitude, saying that he needed two more. The gun in his right hand, a revolver. Santa had grabbed June from behind and pressed what Junpei's shaken brain identified as a revolver roughly against her temple. What was he doing with a gun? Where on earth had Santa possibly found a gun? Junpei's questions roared in his mind, but his, his mouth refused to ask them. Someone spoke, almost as though he'd sensed Junpei's confusion. The gun's from the other room. What room? One of the rooms behind door six. I should have known he was going to do this. I should have taken the gun. <laughs> well, too, well, it's too late now, fat ass. Damn it! A mixture of fury and frustration twisted on Seven's face and he glared at Santa. Santa, for his part, didn't so much as flinch. The corner of his lip twitched into a slightly wider smile. Then the smile faded and he began to move. He walked backward, dragging June with him. Before long, his back was resting against the door. On the wall next to him was the red. He put his hand on the scanner panel, quickly, and then forced June to do the same. Now, time for you to start following my orders. Ace, Lotus, congratulations. I've chosen you to come with me. Put your hands on the red. 3 plus 6 plus 1 plus 8 equals 18. That was what Santa meant when he said he needed two more. Hey, you deaf? I gave you an order. Santa's eyes narrowed to slits. He glared at Ace and Lotus. They stayed frozen like deer caught in the headlights of an oncoming car. Right. Fine. I didn't want to waste any bullets, but you guys just don't get it. No sooner were the words out of Santa's mouth than his hand twitched. And the gun roared. A section of the floor exploded, scattering wooden splinters across the floor. A thin plume of smoke snaked out of the hole in the floor. There could be no doubt that the gun was real, and worked. But... why? Santa, why are you... Clover's voice spoke in betrayal and disbelief. Santa, I thought... I thought you were one of us. I thought we were friends. What? You knew about the leaf word and the four-leaf clover. Santa's cheek twitched almost imperceptibly. What the hell is that shit? I've got no idea. You're lying. Shut up. Just shut up, you stupid bitch. You want me to put a bullet in your fucking head? Flecks of spit flew from Santa's mouth. His face twisted with rage. Clover recoiled, her eyes wide. When she spoke, her voice was very small. Santa... He snorted and shook his head vigorously and turned to face Ace and Lotus. All right, assholes. What are you still standing there for? Get over and scan those bracelets. I don't have all day. Ugh, what's the matter? You hear it starting to go? Going senile, maybe? Ace and Lotus still didn't move. It almost seemed as if they couldn't move. June's face was pale behind Santa's arm. Her eyes were wild and her chest heaved with every quick breath, like an animal cornered by a predator. Junpei's mind worked furiously. What were they going to do? Then he realized something. There was nothing they needed to do. There was nothing to debate. June's safety was the first priority. That much was obvious. Doing as Santa had commanded meant that she would be safe for, from at least two threats. She wouldn't be shot and she would leave the ship alive along with Santa, Ace, and Lotus. There was only one thing for Junpei to do. He turned to Ace and Lotus. Please. Go. Huh? But... Jumpy, what are you saying? If you stay here, you're gonna be stuck, Jumpy. And so will Clover and Seven. I know. But you don't need to worry about us. We'll figure something out. Right, Seven? Right. You just leave it to us. It's gonna piss me off to do what Santa says, but... Don't worry about me either. There's still something I have to take care of. But, no, you can't. Ace, Lotus, don't do it. Don't worry about me, please. June was almost crying. Junpei walked around behind Ace and Lotus. Without a word, he laid a hand on each of their backs and gently pushed them forward. They almost stumbled, but then righted themselves and took another step, and another. They turned around and Junpei nodded. Ace and Lotus turned around again and walked slowly toward the door where Santa was waiting for them.
After what seemed like an eternity, they stopped in front of the door marked 9. Santa smiled. Alright, now let's get those hands on the scanner panel. What's the hold up? What, you think I'm fucking around here? I don't give a shit about this girl. Red doesn't need a person, you know. All I need is the bracelet. You get it? Good. Put your fucking hands on the scanner panel. I'm not gonna say it again. He shoved the revolver harder against June's head and she winced. Fine. Ace sighed, defeated, and placed his hand on the scanner panel. Lotus went next. Lotus glared at Santa and slammed her hand onto the scanner panel. The fourth asterisk blinked on. Good job. Now Lotus, pull that lever. As soon as the door opens, you get your ass in there. Try anything stupid and you know what happens, right? Junpei could almost hear Lotus's teeth grind. The door slid open. Door number 9 opened at last. It opened with a low, powerful rumble. A drum roll to welcome the chosen few. Alright, go! Lotus and Ace walked through the door, their eyes furious but defeated. Santa waited until they were all the way inside, then hauled himself and June across the threshold as well. Six. Seven. Eight. Later. After exactly nine seconds, the door swung shut. The gust of air it created caused the candles of the altar to flicker and die. The room fell silent. Junpei, Clover, and Seven had been left behind. Clover looked down at her hand and traced her, with her finger the faint blue veins that crisscrossed them. Seven shoved his arms into the front of his overalls and scratched his stomach. No one spoke. Silence made the air feel thick and oppressive. Desperate for something, anything to occupy his mind, Junpei walked to the larger of the two nine doors. He stood in front of it and looked at the red. The red engaged. He moved to the smaller door. The red read vacant. The digital root of the remaining people was seven. Five plus four plus seven equals sixteen. One plus six equals seven. There was no possible way for them to open a door with a nine on it. Junpei touched the surface of the door. He thought about June, about Akane Kurashiki. Was she safe? That was all that mattered to him. If she was alive, if she'd escaped this horrible boat, that was what Junpei prayed for. Seven came up next to him. He pulled off his hat, scratched his head, and sighed. So, what do you want to do, Junpei? And we'll figure out what we want to do in the next episode. I'm going to leave this off on a cliffhanger. Thank you guys so much for watching. And in the next episode, we're going to go ahead and see if we could do something. There's not really much we can do. So, panic maybe? Hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.